is my phone is here. I was wondering where it went. So thank you for that, that generous introduction. Um, I guess I don't need to say anything else because you've heard basically everything there is to hear about me. Um, before I start, I just want to start by saying thank you to Julie and Rachel and the team here at the Contemporary for making space for these conversations. I think it's important. Um, I have to say that um, Julie's uh, method of inviting me was um, ingenious in that she didn't give me a topic. So I have been struggling for months now to figure out exactly what I wanted to talk about. And um, after about 33 drafts, I have a few notes that I want to cover. But before I start talking to you, um, I know we all come to these talks and we have expectations, right? Like, there's things that you probably want to know, or there's a reason why you're sitting here other than it's cold outside. So um, I do have a pen. And if anyone cares to tell me, I would love to hear what your expectations are for this talk. What do you want to know? And I will try to find a way to weave it into my talk and or address it later. So anybody have an agenda that I should know about? <laughs> Go ahead. A collaboration, like people at tech, there's lots of engineers, you know, genius tech people, and then there's lots of artists who would like to maybe collaborate. Mm -hmm. So. Can you guys say it? Anybody else have desires, needs? Yes. I just like being around like-minded people. I know you're dynamic, and so you're bound to attract people like you to the pond. And I <laughs> being that pond, so. It's great. Thank you, Gail. Yes. Um, my background is also, my educational background is also rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So um, that's not like a totally formulated thought, but it is something that. So you want to know how you could possibly get into a mess like this? <laughs> With a rhetoric background? Great, I got you there. That, that'll be an easy one. Anybody else? Yes? You've been in town a few months now. Yep. I'm curious as to what your reflections are, where, where we seem to be, and, and where it is that we want to help us go and participate in the local. Mm -hmm. Reflections, that's what all I got here. I'm just going to reflect on where I've been for the last three months. But So that's a great question. Um, if I don't answer it completely, let me know at the end. Anybody else up front? Yes. Hi. Um, I graduated from Georgia State in 2012. I love that question. I think it would take me the rest of my life to answer that question. Um, but but I, I like that you brought that up, because I think it is a good point. Yes, Julie. Um, I would like to know your opinion on what the appetite for contemporary art is in Atlanta. Appetite for contemporary art. Well, I will say that um, Julie is not feeding me until after the talk, so I totally agree. Um, all right, this is great. Anybody else? Because I do have a time limit. I'm going to have to keep, keep it short. Is it? Good. Okay, so um, thank you for sharing. And uh, okay, the 33 different presentations. Should I just throw this aside now that I have new information coming in? I kind of feel like I should, but I won't. She's shaking her head no. So I will, I, will, I will follow this a little bit. And I'll do my best to keep your wishes and expectations in mind as I talk. Um, first of all, really quickly, I know some of you. Uh, not all of you, but I do know a lot of you. I just want to do a little test here. If you, I'm going to say a name or a title. Um, if it relates to you in any way, you feel like it's something that you do, can you just raise your hand for me? And, and I'll do it with you. Um, if you identify as an artist, go ahead and raise your hand. Hi, come on, artists. Well, we're in, we're in a gallery here. Great. Okay. If you identify as a student, raise your hand. Great. I love that. A teacher, raise your hand. An administrator, raise your hand. Someone who makes that art stuff happen. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, entrepreneur. Anybody? Anybody running a business with their art? Uh, put your hand up. I know you are. Okay. Um, who's an art consumer here? Yes. Okay. So it's kind of silly, and I was going to actually count, but there's really no point here in counting because I do this exercise one, two, um, show you all that my arm is always up, right? I've been many, many, many things, and I have many hats. 
And um, most of my life, I was told to pick one. Well, that was the worst advice I've ever gotten in my life. I see a lot of heads nodding. Yeah, don't do that. And so I'm excited to see all these hands in the air. So, so you know, like kind of like give yourselves a round of applause for doing like 27 different things and hold on to those hats, right? They're going to come in handy. Um, we're all many things, and I think that's important to kind of recognize that this gives us different perspectives. And, um, you know, since you don't know me that much other than that really dry bio that Georgia Tech fabricated for me, no offense, Stephanie, who helped write it. But um, I'm going to go, go a little bit further back to give you a little bit of perspective of how far I've come. So when I was about this high, um, I, I found this, this tool here. And it was probably a pencil. And it was probably my father's. And I learned how to hold it. And ever since I was a small child and I could kind of hold a pencil in my hand, I wrote. I wrote poems, I wrote stories, I wrote narratives, I wrote on napkins, I wrote on walls. Not a good idea. Um, I wrote on everything. I wrote my entire life. I never uttered the word artist or writer alongside my name until my mid-twenties. Just hold on to that. That's just a little bit of information, put it behind you. This is what I call kind of an art memory for me and an art interrupter. And it's going to be really important to kind of what I'm going to talk about as we start talking about emerging and emergent art and talking to different people. Um, you know, in my childhood, art was something that someone else did. It, it happened in other uh, families, people who were rich did it. And furthermore, you know, you just won't get it, okay? So why don't you just kind of stick with your own kind? So I didn't have that art experience. Now I know there's artists here, and yay, this is awesome. Jonah, pleasure to see you. Um, it's great to know that there are also people who had a really different experience growing up, and they had art, and they were encouraged to be creative. And I think both of these narratives are really important. It's not that I want you to feel bad for me that I didn't have art. It's that I want you to think for a moment about your own histories. And um, think about an art memory that you have that really stands out where you know, you have that moment where like time freezes, and you remember like the way the sunlight was coming in, and, and everything about it. Um, these are art bubbles. These are moments where you can change your life. I'm going to tell you one. Mine happens to be a negative one, but I have a positive one I'll tell later. Um, I remember, let's see, how old was I? I don't remember how old I was. I was old enough to go like this and pull myself up on the sink to see my face in the mirror. Right? That's how old I was. Um, could have been last year for my height, but, <laughs> but it was a long time ago, trust me. And, so, and I was doing this because I was really... Um, I like to sing in the bathroom. You know those tile bathrooms, we only had one. And I was singing in the bathroom really loudly. It was probably a Saturday morning based on the fact that my father opened the door and he stood there and he looked down at me. And I remember the sunlight was coming in this way. And I was happy and I was coming down to Relevate. He was smiling, so that's a good thing. And then he said to me, <clears throat> it's a good thing you do really well at school. Right? Now, you say, oh, now, because you're an adult. As a child, I was like, really sure what to make of that. Um, i tell you what happened, though. I stopped singing for a long time. For a long time, I lost that part of my voice. And that's OK. Again, don't feel bad for me, because what it is is it's a little bubble that I still remember now. I sing a lot now, and I'll spare you that, because I'm still not very good at it. But I have that bubble to kind of remind me of a moment when I didn't have that. And that's joy, right? These are called interrupter moments. So you know, humor me for a moment. Think back to that kind of preschool, and I don't mean preschool, I mean before you start going to school. See if you can find a memory, a moment where you had a creative impulse or being artistic and it was either positive or negative. Like it was either squashed, y'all remember that, or it was either really an amazing thing. Like you got the star role in the urban nutcracker, I don't know, whatever that is, whatever turns you on. Like just take a minute, be selfish, see if you can find that moment. If you want to share, you can. You don't have to. You probably don't have time for the real sharing moments here with the clock ticking. Um, but do that for yourself. Hold that moment. And we can share later or share with your people that you came with. Um, again, these are interrupters. These are things that you can pull out later, whether they're positive or negative, and use them to change your life and others. Right? I'm standing here telling you a story about when I was this tall in a hope that there will be some inspiration and, and some opening. So um, now I'm going to tell you an amazing story about an interrupter moment. And I'm a little nervous because my wife is here, and she's heard this story. So she's going to pretend to walk away, but she won't really. Um, OK, so I'm going to tell you about my first dance. 
Okay, so you know where I came from, right? And I told you the story of having no art in my life for a reason. So we're set up. I'm 24 now. This was just last year. And um, I'm with a, a good friend of mine, and it's Friday night, and I'm going, I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what you want to do. Because we clearly had done everything there was to possibly do in the city of Philadelphia. Clearly, we were bored. And she said, well, there's a show over at this theater, a dance show. I was like, contemporary dance or modern dance? Mm. I don't, I don't think so. And she said, no, come on, what else are we going to do? I mean, we've done everything else, so let's go to the show. And I'm like, I don't know. She's like, look, there's five or six companies. They're only going to be 10 minutes each. each. If you hate them, you can leave. And I was like, I got to go. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, and then you tell me what happened. I, um, I remember the weather. It was fall. I remember sitting on a concrete bench outside of the theater, the Mandel Theater at Drexel University. I remember that I was facing east on the bench and there was a dancer behind me who bought mod above my head. I remember following the dancer into the theater. I remember where I sat, M2. And I remember a really good part of the show. Obviously, this is a, this is a bubble, right? This is one of these interrupter moments where my life changed. So I, um, there were five or six companies of which I don't remember most. I do remember one company, Group Motion, um, because the way they were moving felt relational to me. And I was like, I can, I, can, I can do that. They weren't doing that modern dance day where like no one matters and you're not there. Um, and then this thing happened, right? This solo started. There was this beautiful movement on stage, barely there. And the movement was beautiful. The woman was beautiful. And then madness. There was text. There was a story. She was talking, and she was talking to me. There was nobody else in the room, clearly. <laughs> Because of my history of writing and loving words, for the first time in my life, I connected to dance in a way that, I mean, I was shaking. I was vibrating inside. I was like, I have to know. And then I was t tortured because I didn't know whether she was actually live and speaking. In other words, was it her story or whether she was pre-recorded? It wasn't even her voice. So I saw a piece. I felt a piece for the first time in my life. And my life changed. Um, I'll tell you how much my life changed after that. So that woman is my wife now. She's standing back there. <laughs> We've been together for 21 years. And since then, I have been fully submerged. Um, so I forgot one really important part of the story. So not only did I, my life change there through this piece of art that I let in, I ran into her afterwards at a cafe. And um, I was like, well, I have to go say something. <laughs> so I got to the table, and I said the first thing that came to my mind, and I said, I saw your show. <laughs> that was all I had to say. And she said, so what would you think? And I said, it was disturbing, which was not what she was expecting to hear because I didn't have any adequate. I'm supposed to say it's nice. I liked it. I said it was disturbing to me. I, I, I remember ghosts. And she said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer. Wow, look at that. Bam. First time in my life that I brought together my name, Madison, with this idea and artistic identity as a writer. So you can imagine my life completely changed from there. Since then, I have been everything that has anything to do with theater. I have been an usher. I have managed the box office. I have been a set designer, a lighting designer. I have been a director, a choreographer, a programmer, a curator, a development director. You name it, I've done it. Student engagement, audience, engage, audience engagement, and whenever necessary, janitor. If I've got to plug the toilet so that people can go to the bathroom when they're coming to see a show, I've shoveled roofs, you name it. It's been an amazing journey, but only because I let an interrupter do its job, interrupt my business as usual. I could have left that dance, right, and gone back to my job. I worked in medical publishing, which was kind of close to writing, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and I was miserable, right? And now look at me. I'm here now with you in Georgia as the director of the Office of the Arts. I have, let's see, um, a 1,200-seat proscenium house that I'm responsible for, a one to 300-seat flexible house, 400 acres, acres to curate, I don't even know how many other spaces in theaters where there's a possibility to do art. There's uh, 15,000 undergraduate students, um, about 6,000, 6,500 graduate students, um, 1,000 full-time faculty, and about 7,000 staff. And guess what? They're all doing. They're all looking at me saying, so what you gonna do? <laughs> right? 
what's she going to do? And I have answered very honestly, and I said, hmm, I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't have a road map. And how awesome and freeing is that? Yeah. Right? And I'm just saying, I don't know. So what I've done, instead of fabricating some uh, plan, which wouldn't be genuine because I don't know anything about Atlanta. I don't know anything about you all. I don't know it, y'all better. <laughs> I don't know anything about what's already happening here, what's happened here, the history. I have no right to come in here and, and to put my agenda on this place. My job is to listen, and that's what I've done. So for three months now, I've listened to every single person who's dared to share whatever it is, what they like about Atlanta, what they hate, what art is going on, what's working, what's not working. It's awesome. And if I shut up enough, which I can't do tonight, because I'm being paid to stand here, um, you know what happens? Something magical. They give me one of those pearls, one of those interrupters, one of those art interrupters. If I sit there long enough, what happens is they tell me a story about a time when this happened that had to do with the arts. When I used to play 17 instruments before I came to Georgia Tech, or when I, you know, I almost was on Broadway once, and or when I, I was going to sing, but my father told me not to, if I'm just quiet enough, and I let them tell the story, then I put those pearls, those are jewels, those are invaluable. I put them in my pockets because these are the people that I'm going to share a stage with, and this is how we get on common ground. And at some point, I'm going to give them their jewels back. And I'm like, you gave me this, right? You told me you always wanted to dance. So dance, right? I don't know what that looks like. We're not talking about professional arts. We're talking about inspiration. So bringing it back, rolling it back to GT, um, you know, why did I ask you about your memories? Because I think it's important for us to know where we came from and important for us to pull those jewels, to pull them out when we need them. I don't know what your daily lives are like, or your nightly lives, or your daily nightly lives. If you're anything in the arts, you work all the time. But there's <laughs> moments where it just sucks, right? And there's moments where you're like, why am I doing this? And why am I, I have to market it? I have to make it. I have to sell it. Um, and you can just pull out one of those jewels. <laughs> you know, one of those moments where you changed your life. And um, so, so hold on to those, because that's all I'm holding on to right now. And, um, Hold on to the interrupters. Now, we have our interrupters, so we have our common ground, which I think is really important. What am I going to do? Right? Well, I'm going to start with, this is going to sound a little woo-woo, bear with me. I'm going to start with the culture of yes. Right? Um, yes does something in your body, so you can nod your head. When you start with yes, there's physiological changes in your body. You can Google that. I, I will spare you that. But yes does three other really important things. Um, every idea that comes across my desk, I say yes. And they're like, so the first thing it does is it relieves tension. There's a lot of anxiety. You've got this baby, right? You've been holding this baby for a long time. This is my art baby. This is like, I've wanted to make this piece since forever. And now there's someone here who feels like some kind of hope, some kind of bright light, and I'm going to give it to you. So you're tense. Yeah, I get it. So I say yes. Of course I'm going to say yes. There's nothing but yes. Relieve the tension. Then all of a sudden, instead of like you over there and you over there, we're both over here like this. Oh, look at it. It's right here. This cute. We're both on the same side of the table. Again, starting with yes. Even if I know, like, this is going to cost $5 million. It ain't probably never going to happen anytime this year. You start with yes. They come on this side of the table. We're looking at it together. You and me, right? It's your idea. And then the other thing that yes does for me, it empowers you, you, all of you who come to me with ideas to go like, yeah, OK. And then they run out the door. They take their idea with them, and they continue working on it, which is a blessing, because there's only one of me. I couldn't possibly bring all of these dreams to fruition, right? So I need every single person in this room, every person I talk to, to bring this stuff to life, right? So when, I ask, when you ask me what I'm going to do with GT, well, I don't know. You, what are you going to do with GT? What do you want to do with GT? You bring that to me. I say yes. I'll help you however I can. Then you run out the door, and you, you start making it happen. And I'll throw things in as needed. So we start with yes. And then I have a tool belt. Right now, I only have this. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I only have this microphone on, on my tool belt. But I have some invisible tools that um, are really helpful that I want to share with you. Um, I only have 10 tonight. Sometimes I have more, sometimes I have less. And I might squish these together, being cognizant of time. Look at that, I'm good. I've been talking really fast. Um, OK, so first of all, me. I've got to figure out this, this body, right? If people are going to be looking to me for any kind of vision and direction, I have to understand my job as a curator. And I have to curate differently. You're like, well, what does that mean? 
Well, I don't know. That means I gotta challenge myself. That means I can't get into these rote aberrations of like, this artist at this time because it might tell. I have to figure out what is happening in the fabric. I have to talk to people. I have to ask people for help. I have to pull artists in and say like, you know, I was just talking to Kyle and we talk about work and you know, it's great, this piece is happening now, but Kyle has probably made pavement, what, two, three years ago. And at some point, you know, as an artist, you make a work and then it tours later. And sometimes the tours are really long, sometimes it's a lot longer than you ever want it to. And you want to move on as an artist. You're on to different things and yet your money source is pulling you back to remount this work when in fact your progress as an artist is to kind of move forward and to create something new. So there's that tension and, and you know, where do presenters fit in that and what is our job? And I think our job has been to create that tension largely for a long time, but what if we were part of the solution? What if we looked at artists and said, well, well I don't know, instead of talking to just agents and looking at marketing and dollars, like what if we say like, well, I don't know, what works for you? What do you want to be doing here? And maybe we show the ugly baby performance that isn't polished and complete and whatever that it might be 10 years from now, but we work on something that is actually going to advance um, the artist. We've got audience engagement, which I've been doing for years. Student engagement, really important. Community engagement. No one has ever asked me about artist engagement in any of the jobs that I've had. And I think that's a shame. So I think there's four buckets here of engagement that we have to keep focusing on. And that's up to me to keep challenging my viewpoint and, and from where I'm sitting and where I'm standing. And maybe I don't have any idea what I'm going to curate next season. Maybe it's time to put all of you in a room, close the door, put in food and water, and see what happens. And come back in a day. Why not? I mean, why not? Right? We don't know. You don't know what's going to happen synergistically. So my job, tool number one, I got to always tell myself to curate differently. Whatever worked where I was last week, last year, is not going to work now. Because now is now. It's a different environment. Two, take art out of the box. We all know this. And we talk about this. We're going to do something different, really out of the box. But look, I'm new to the South, so I just got introduced to football. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Wow, what do I say? I say like 50,000 people walking past my theater, past my theater, uh, into it. And um, so I, I had the pleasure of going to a football game. And, um, and we're going to another one this weekend. And, um, and I got the good seats. Um, yeah, GT Clemson, go, whoever. Somebody, somebody go and do something. Um, I love sports. So it was crazy though. I, I got the good seats, which are really awful in my opinion. They're the 50 yard line, it's really hot. <laughs> There's no shade. Um, water's $4. I was like, okay. But the energy, right? It's exciting. I was like, why can't we have this in the theater? This is awesome. To me, the same thing happened over and over again, but maybe that's what people feel like when they watch contemporary dance. Because you know? it is repetitive, right? That's how we get these messages across. So I, um, I did leave at, at intermission, <laughs> halftime. <laughs> and, um, but you know what was awesome? Although I was a little bit looking over my shoulder, I, um, nobody was like, are you going to come back? You look what we do in the theater, right? We ask them, are you going to come back? Because you know there's no late, late seating. So if you're leaving, you have to leave. We like, make this big issue. And, and then I, I realized, this kind of goes back to curate differently, but also outside the box. Like, I'm asking all these people who just go past the theater to come and sit in a dark theater and be quiet and not leave until it's over, regardless of whether we're winning, they like it or not. So shame on me for not putting myself in someone else's seat. So when I think about curating outside of the box and taking art outside the box, what if I put a piece in the football stadium? Now it would take a special kind of artist who's gonna wanna be willing to deal with the parameters of a space at large and the coming and going, but I'm sure there's somebody out there. I'll put out an RFP. Um, why not? You know, like, why not take all the seats out of the first center? Part of the problem, people don't come to art because they're afraid if they don't like it, they can't leave. Well, if there's no seats, you can leave whenever you want. Okay. She's laughing. I'm making my marketing manager laugh. <laughs> She's like, I don't know how to do this. Um, but, but why not? I don't know. I don't know if it'll work. I mean, it could not. It could totally fail, right? And I could be, you know, a janitor again. And that's okay, too. But, but I think really taking art outside of the box. And whatever your box is, we all have our boxes. Whether you're creating art or whether you're presenting art, we all have things that we struggle with. Um, support the creators, not just the projects. I think I said this a little bit already, but it's really important that you're asking artists 
where they are in their process, right? And, and in terms of what they need and, and where they're going and what they want. Besides, you know, it's great to have a show, but maybe they want something else. Maybe they need something <laughs> else. I, I'm on a really rich campus. We got space. We got brilliance. We got students. We got energy. We have a lot of things. And we can even find some money. Um, so, right, yeah, I know. I mean, there's money out there. I, I know it. I see it driving by, going to the football stadium. Um, <laughs> and there's money for art, too, right? They're out there. We just got to gotta make the right ask. And so I think part of my job is to, is to sit down and gather those people and make the ask. Um, we know this. This is speaking to the choir, but this is kind of to remind myself process and product, both important. And to highlight the process, we cover the process a lot, right? Um, we had um, dress rehearsal and a run through today. Well, you know, only the people who were working saw it. And I don't know, maybe we should have those ugly moments. I don't know how all the choreographers in the room feel about that, but you know, since there's at least three of you here that I know, um, I'll just move on to the next thing because they're kind of looking at me funny. Um, another thing that I want to focus on is really remembering to support collaborative work as opposed to cooperative work. So cooperative work is this idea of, um, let's say I bring in Latin jazz group, and then I reach out to the Latino community. And that's great. I think the bridge building is nice. It's not deep. It goes away when the show goes away, and then we start over again. So I think there's a place for that, but I think I'm in a position in my life, in my career, in my desires to do something a little bit differently. And um, collaborative work is, is really beyond that transactional level. It's, it's really deep. It requires you to be present. And it has transformational learning. Um, this is my favorite. This one I, I learned a couple weeks ago because I was struggling with this idea of, of writing something and do I want to say interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary? I was like, Jesus, Lord, what, what is the difference? So I did some research, and, um, and now I think I've got it. So if you are ever confused, I want transdisciplinary work. Now transdisciplinary, right? Transdisciplinary <laughs> work is work that actually, when you think about a team, imagine this. This happened to me. It's a true story, I swear. Um, you know how most plays are produced. So the writer sits in the room, screaming, like, wait. goes off to a director, and then the play happens. That's awesome. That's not transdisciplinary. That's probably multidisciplinary at best. Um, what if, as the writer is writing the play, somebody like, I don't know, Paula Vogel, for example, um, the director is there, and the actors are there, and the dramaturg is there, and the designers are there. And as literally, as the page is going across to the director and to the actors, the writer is there hearing the words go live and making changes. That's transdisciplinary. So, so from inception, we take the artist and all of the people it's going to take to build whatever the project is, and boom, it's going to be radically different than interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So multidisciplinary by is, um, is additive. So multidisciplinary is how a lot of work is done now, and that has to do with money sometimes, but also maybe a mindset. I write, I hand it to you, and then we do have some work together. You know, we all get to the theater, and we all have the tech moment, the lighting comes together, the costumes come together, but it really was kind of mostly created in a segmented manner with a little bit of crossover and conversation. So again, transdisciplinary is my, is my goal, to transform. We do a lot of residencies, uh, maybe not a lot, we need to do more, but the ones that we do haven't been really that grounded, and we haven't figured out a structure to support art from the point of inception. You know, and I think that, that would be amazing. Look, this is a university. This is what we should be doing, right? So the last couple of tools I've got on my belt um, is this idea of creating connectors. Um, we are translators. That's what I do. I'm a matchmaker and a translator. I translate from this medium to that medium. So when I go to the mechanical engineers, and they want to know, what do I want to do with the Dance Theater of Harlem? I'm like, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do with Dance Theater of Harlem. And it's going to work like this. So I have to speak many languages. And I have to give them the tools to understand how they can intersect and access the work. Um, catalysts. I need like all of you to be like me. And at any given moment, to inter intersperse a moment of art. Like at the dentist. I heard the drill going. It wasn't my drill. I was safe. And um, it reminded me of of when um, someone on, uh, I think it was a trumpet or a trombone, was warming up their lips in their thing. Like, like, oh my god, that's just like a warm up for Preservation Hall Jazz. 
That's odd, right, for someone to say that. But I insert art whenever possible, right? And, and I think we can all have those moments. You're walking down the street and, oh, that reminds me of, uh, you know, Picasso. Look at that, Picasso in the pavement. People are like, mm, okay. But it works. You know, I was at a, this is an exciting meeting I went to today. Um, they're repaving a parking lot. Huh? Huh? Yeah. And they were talking about the demolition, and they're talking about the timeline, and all these, these amazing things. And I said, cool. Wouldn't it be great if we set up tables over here and had a little stage for performances? Complete interrupter, catalyst moment. Everyone stopped. You know, it's all like designers and architects and paving people. And they actually were like, hmm, yeah, I never thought of that. We all have these moments. Every single meeting, every everything you go to, especially when it doesn't have anything to do with art, find a moment to intersect, to be a catalyst, to excite people, right? This is, um, this is one of the funnest things I do, actually, because people are just like, what? Where do you come from? What, what's wrong with you? Um, and this idea of, in, again, interrupters and interruptions. Um, get those moments. Find those precious gems that you have of your own and hold them and get, uh, get ones from other people. So as you guys start sharing these stories and think back, um, does anyone want to share their, their memory? Can I share one with you that I heard from yeah. a friend yesterday? I feel like I was meant to share this. Great. This is the most amazing art interrupt. I wouldn't have known that to call that yesterday. But my friend is telling me how her mother is now 80 years old and is redoing a den. And she decides to put up all of her kids' diplomas on the wall. And she called her son, who's 50 something now, saying, Honey, I can't find your University of Michigan <laughs> diploma. And he said, Well, Mom, actually, it's because I never graduated. I <laughs> 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 to school. Six Just find another way to draw on walls. So I think these are important. So find, find your art moments, find your little art bubbles, your jewels, keep them for yourself, share them with people. This is how we're going to connect. Um, this is how we're going to energize. Not everyone's going to be an artist. I don't expect everyone at GT to, to quit engineering. And if they did, Lord help us. We'd have crappy cars and nothing would work and the chairs would fall apart. And um, I don't know what happened with art, but it's not for everyone as a field, but in terms of like a moment to think about changing your life or changing your career or kind of in, in bringing in new energies. I think it's really important. Okay, my last tool, and then I will and have it open for questions. Um, this is the most important one, and if you've already heard this, I'm sorry, some of you have heard this probably because it's my favorite new story. Okay, so this is an imaginary roll of tape, right? You probably heard this. People are smiling if they all know this story. You're the only one I know who's heard it. All right, um, my last tool is encouraging creative capacity. So you know, I just moved here, and, and part of moving is packing, and packing sucks, frankly. And um, after being 12 years in a house, I had a lot of stuff, we'll keep it at that. So taping, taping, taping boxes, and you know that sticky, horrible tape, and you pull it out, and it sticks to the thing, and then it folds up on itself, and you're like, God, cutting it, and I don't have a scissors, because I refuse, I get it with my teeth. Whatever, hours of doing that, I was getting very frustrated, and Myra, my partner, was like, you know what, I will, um, let, let me just kind of take that over from you. And so I was like, okay, fine. Okay, okay, fine. And um, she proceeds to take the roll of tape from me. She turns it upside down, measures it, not sticky side down, across the box, proceeds to cut it and put it on there neatly and easily. Right? 
how stupid did I feel? How stupid did I feel that never once in my life, for 40 some odd years of taping shit, did I ever turn the roll of tape over? Okay, this is creative capacity, because she has a different perspective, and she has a different life and a different viewpoint. She didn't think about it. This isn't stuff you think about. This is just stuff you do. She turned the roll of tape over. That's crazy. And how wonderful is it that I have a, a big enough ego to admit to an entire room of strangers that I was too dumb to turn a roll of tape over. How awesome is that? That is creative capacity. And that is probably my like, most favorite example and the best tool that we have in our belt is to stay open to those learning moments, no matter how old you are. So that's the formal speech this evening. There's one thing that's really glaringly missing from this whole talk, because I'm supposed to be talking about Georgia Tech and what I'm going to do and, and art, right? And I haven't said a damn word about presenting art, have I? And so I'm going to actually just kind of do something a little crazy here, because I, I wonder, and, and I'm wondering, and, and Stephanie, the marketing manager, doesn't even know this yet, um, should we be presenting art on a university campus? I don't know. I mean, like, I went through this whole thing. I wrote this thing 33 times about how I'm going to talk about what we're doing at Georgia Tech and how we're going to do this and this. And, and then when it came down to what this kind of rule is and what I ended up talking about tonight, I talked more about inspiration and tools, um, ways of being in the world, um, ways of relating, how to support artists and process. But I didn't talk anything about my plans for presenting work. And I, and I wonder, though, I mean, I seriously wonder, like, maybe we shouldn't be presenting work. Maybe we should be supporting work in the, the gazillion other ways that you can support work. I don't know. I mean, this is a, a wide open question. And with that, I'll probably duck behind the podium where it's safe. Um, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> This is the scary part, right? Now this is the part where I guess we have <clears throat> questions. Yes? Why not present art? Well, why not? Um, well, a couple reasons, easy reasons. It's really expensive to present art. And, I, and, it, and if my goal is to serve audiences, students, uh, community, and artists, is the presentational work on the stage, just playing devil's advocate, is that doing any of that in a real deep transformational way. Now my life was changed by seeing a work of art on the stage. So you obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to someone who's like, oh, hello, are you kidding me? Changed my life. But, but uh, you know, I just, I have this amazing group of thinkers here and I'm curious what y'all think about that. My research faculty at Tech, I've been at Tech for eight years. Mm -hmm. Uh, the work that I do is with interactive media, and over the summer, there were the sculptures that went out around Tech's campus, mm -hmm. and all over, I think there's 20-something? There was 15, and now there's seven left. Okay, yep. okay. So there, there are a number of them, but one of the issues with it is they popped up overnight, mm -hmm. and uh, my group was charged with doing an augmented reality um, kind of curation of these things. You go out and you just get information about them because they have limited signage. So I was trying to see what students were thinking of these things that really, it, it was just one day they were there and it was like, <laughs> there. there wasn't a whole lot of information about it. Right. And if you went on the Georgia Tech subreddit, there was um, a thread that had hundreds and hundreds of comments of half the students saying, I hope my student group didn't pay for this. I can't believe it. What is this? Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with tech. Yeah. And there was a good number of students that were saying, this is great. We don't have anything like this on campus. Um, this is kind of what makes tech, in a way, not a university mm. because it doesn't have like the other half of the equation, I guess. And I was really impressed with how many students were coming up in defense of these things, mm -hmm. even though they didn't know who made them, why they were there, how long they were there, or where they came from. Yeah. That's a, that's a great example, and, and that's a lot of what I've been hearing about like, the sculpture exhibit in general. And, and um, I think Office of the Arts, I think it is our duty to provide context and, and an open forum for those conversations, because that's what art is, right? It, it triggers conversations, right? It's supposed to make you think and debate over these things, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. So that's great that it happened. I wish it was still happening, that we could still, and, and have an open discussion about that. Um, 
and maybe some curatorial control from the students. You know? Thomas, do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? What's the hardest thing that you've encountered so far? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my fear and insecurity and, and lack of having the perfect plan. I mean, dealing with my own um, history and a real sincere desire to make something not just brilliant, but to make something that is sustainable, to make something that is going to be here when I'm gone. I can build amazing programs, and I've done it for many years. And then I leave, and they fall apart, which tells me I have not done my job. Because a real to do it right, you have to build a program, whether it's a, a curatorial vision or whatever it is, and it should it should outlast your stay, right? Um, so to me, that's the biggest struggle. I mean, I love that I have vision, but but vision alone. It's just vision. That's just me talking to myself. And, and I do that all the time by myself. And that's great. But in order for me to share it, um, I have to put it out there in a way that I think is sustainable. So I think I am my own biggest challenge in terms of struggling with that um, desire to do something amazing right now, which I could do, because I know how to get programs up pretty quickly and motivate people. Um, but that's just me. And then if I step out, even for a month, to do something else, right, energy dies down. So I actually have to teach people how to support the things that they want and how to really be vibrant and to be loud. Um, and they want to. I mean, the students are amazing. Everyone who sat in my office, as I told you, they're sharing these personal narratives, these jewels, but they also, they have passion. And just to teach them, it's one, it's okay. It's okay to be passionate and be an engineer. It's okay. <laughs> yes. You know? And it's okay to be quiet, too, and to express it in other ways. So I think you know, that, the biggest challenge has been me. Everyone here has been amazing. I mean, the South has been lovely. Georgia Tech has been lovely. Sure, it's got bureaucracy. I mean, it's a university. That's, I, I came from that, so that I, I don't have any surprises. I didn't have any illusions about that. So the biggest challenge is me struggling with my, you know, needs and desires to do something phenomenal right now, or me pulling my own reins in and saying, let's just wait, let's edit this, let's think about this, let's make sure we have all the people involved. And, um, or at least enough of them that it can start building its own wave. So I think that can be getting more honest than that. I mean, <laughs> anything else? I didn't get to all the burning questions, though. Rhetoric, well, you can see how I got into this mess. Whoever asked about rhetoric and communications, you can go anywhere with that degree. Um, Reflections, emerging versus emerged. I don't think there's ever anything that is fully emerged. <laughs> um, gosh, I wrote a play a year and a half ago, a playwright. That was a magical mistake and, and a miracle. You know, like it didn't just happen if you just open to it. Um, I went back to school for an environmental science degree. I mean, I'm all over the place. It's awesome. Um, so we're always emerging. Our work is emerging. We keep um, growing. I hope. Yes, sir. Well, I know you spoke a bit about um, how you bring the arts into you know, the context of Georgia Tech and serving artists. And one thing, um, as an artist, I might find interesting would be how that um, works the other way, like in terms of you've got this huge um, you know, wealth of you know, technical and engineering mm -hmm. you know, um, experience and um, brain power there. You know, how can that be brought to bear on, you know, artistic practice? I mean, that's one thing that all, many of us sort of, you know, lack is that side of it in terms of, you know, sure. can sure. be compared with people that you know, mm -hmm. know those things. Or right. I mean, I think that's a great question, and I think, um, I think it all starts with a conversation. I think on a really basic level, we start in a room together. And, um, you know, if you're interested in, there's so many degrees at Georgia Tech that I don't even understand what they do yet. Like, I'm trying to break down the science of it um, and learn the language myself. But I think that's where we start. We start with a conversation. We invite artists in and we invite students and faculty in um, based on their maybe interests or studies. And we, we ask that question. <laughs> we ask them. Because you know what? I don't know. Because I don't understand a lot of what they do. Like, there's engineering psychology. And I'm like, 
I don't really know what that means. Are you engineering psychology? I don't understand. And the, the, the young lady was really generous and explained it to me, which confused me further. <laughs> so, um, you know, I have some work to do. But, but yeah, I think, um, I think we have to start with conversations, right, and supporting moments. Um, you know, feel free to email me, text me, put Stonehenge little things on the ground, whatever, to get my attention about like, hey, you know what, I, I got this thing and I, I feel like I need some engineers to help me. And I'll say, what kind of engineer? You say, I don't know. I say, I don't know. So then I'll talk to some engineers and they'll be like, oh, yeah, not here. You got to go here. You got to go here. And then we can start making those connections. That's what my job is. I'm a matchmaker, right? Translator and a matchmaker. So the students, every student that I've talked to wants to work in a creative capacity and wants to, would love to be involved in some kind of artistic creation. They, I mean, every project that's come across, um, they're just fired up. I don't know how they have to find the time, <coughs> but they do. And they definitely have the expertise and they have access to resources. So I think that's, that's key. And how do, we, how do we open up the campus? That's a huge part of what's on my plate. You can start by emailing me, because now there's somebody that can open the door. <laughs> I think that was not there before. And I think that is a huge um, you know, applause uh, applause to to Georgia Tech, you know, the provost and um, the administration for for putting in not a gatekeeper but a door opener. I don't know if they they knew they were getting that when they asked me, but that's what they're getting. I'm like, come on in, everybody. House is open. So yeah, thank you. What's your email address? My email address: Madison Cario at arts.gotech.edu. Google me, find me. I'm easy to find. Or Baba Julie. She'll tell you where to find me. And we're neighbors, right? That's a good question. You know, we are neighbors. And I, you know, I love Georgia Tech, I will tell you. Um, but I've never seen Georgia Tech. Very few in this building, if any. I don't know. How many people are remotely affiliated with Georgia Tech in the room right now? Look at that. It's working, Julie! Students, students. There's 50,000 of them over there. There are. And it's amazing that it's so close. Then there might as well be an ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be a huge thing. How do they get over here? Bribes. Bribes? That's a good idea. Food? Actually, that's a really good idea. Build a bridge. Build a bridge. Build a bridge. M&M's, Skittles, pizza. pizza. But it's really important. I think that's something that it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. how this institution could be so close together. Yep. And and not. I mean, that sounds funny, but I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were resources to build a bridge and somebody, you know, some engineer, some architect collaborate with an artist and build this, You're this, hired, this bridge, you know, to come over? I mean, it, it would be really, I mean, I mean sure. the pie in the sky or whatever, but well, it would be an That's kind of what the bell We could do that. So, to the public. I'm coming back. Yeah, we're going to do a GT system. art bus. So, I'm glad yeah. that that's what we're asking. An art bus. Well, yeah, or just a stop. You know? Mm -hmm. One of those things where just stop right here. Right well, they could walk. You could do some dance. <laughs> 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 weird, right? I walked. It's not far. Jonah, did you walk? John walked. Yes, sir. Someone had their hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that part of like what you said is getting those students over here and making art relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that there's, like I'm actually just doing a project right now where I would love some interactive engineers to work on that. I'm doing data-driven art installations in the CNN building. Wow. And it's, you know, we're, we're artists. I'm very interested in like working with these types of things, but you know, I'm teaching myself how to do it and it's a very slow process because mm -hmm. I just, you know, it's a whole new field to learn. So being able to say, like, you know, here, coming over into the art world and be relevant mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. and then make work that's relevant to what you care about also. Right. And I think that can help. Right. Yes, sir. I think there's also the opposite of that, which is, in the sense, having artists who think differently implement themselves into the sciences. So mm -hmm. um, I'm an artist, and I teach at the University of Georgia, but I also work on with other scientists on like a research vessel and things like that, where I'm just the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, really probably not that, but in a way, I'm that opposite voice that's taking place in a round table that they need as right. much as 
an artist may need somebody to, to make something work. Mm -hmm. but we also need that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's actually the direction that we're, we're oh, I mean, artists usually are thinking, like, we have to get somebody to help us do something. But I think there's also this opposite. Right, we want to make a two-way street. So, I mean, these are all really great points, and I think part of what Julie and I, we stuck our heads together. I think Julie was the second meeting I had, the third day I was in Georgia. And um, one of the things we talked about was that amazing um, skeleton structure outside, that building with no roof, and just putting in a dance floor. Um, I know for a fact that there's many GT students who have no rehearsal space, and any artists on campus who are visiting who have no rehearsal space. Um, and since it's lovely weather here a lot of the year, to you know, pay to put in a dance floor and encourage students to come over here and use it. Because I think, I don't know, relevance is the, I thought it was about relevance, but what I'm finding in the conversations, and they're slow and they're one at a time, but with students is that they just, they had no idea this was here. I mean, they don't even know that the first center is in, on campus, a lot of them. So, so they're so in their own, um, you know, we get in our, our, our walking grids, right? And we, we follow the things that we know and we go down the roads that we know. And, and so I think, a big old fat invitation and an art bus. But then, yes, then we have those conversations about um, both of us being relevant to each other and not one using one form or one side, not science using art and not art using science, but that we, we work transdisciplinary, that we work together kind of from the beginning and figure out and sort through issues, ideas, and problems. Yes, sir? Well, I was just going to say, you beat me to it, but I was going to say maybe we don't need a bridge, we just need an invitation. Mm -hmm. Giant Evite. Well, I was talking to some students last week. I want to make a 40-foot origami um, dragon. So I had a student in my office who's an origami expert and a mechanical engineer, which she told me, she's like, well, what did you think I was? I was like, I don't know. Well, OK. Um, she's like, I just, I'm like, how do you remember all the steps? She's like, I don't. I just see what it's supposed to look like. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Um, so I was trying to figure out how many students it would take to fold this giant piece of paper. But maybe the piece of paper is not. <laughs> an origami dragon, but maybe it is a giant invitation. <laughs> and we fold it into like a giant paper airplane and find a way to launch it just to kind of make that point and to say, yeah, you know, the contemporary is right behind the wings place, which they all know where that is. <laughs> yes. I guess I'll keep bringing some art to campus then. <laughs> There's my reason. I'm, I'm curious about whether tech students are really busy. I mean, it's almost like if you mush them together, they have to get credit for it because otherwise they get too. There's talk about doing that too. So um, I think in terms of engineering, from what I hear, there's maybe one elective um, in, the, in the, the, this five-year trajectory. So that, that's a little busy to me. Um, but, yeah, I do think this mush together and give credit for. So this is another avenue that we're also pursuing. Like, should we uh, formalize a curriculum that offers some fine arts? I mean, I know the architecture students and a lot of the design students, um, to be able to visualize and turn an object around in your head in 3D is a great tool for, for many of the fields. Um, and you won't get that in, unless you practice that. There's a lot of surreptitious artists. It's the people and the people and the people and the no, I don't, I don't know how to bring that out into the community and bring the community to them so that it's clear that it's not just school work. Right. Well, let's talk because that all those people you mentioned are my side of campus. Okay. So all of us who live in tech schools generally, and we're doing a lot of arts and entertainment and culture, mm -hmm. so we can figure it out. It's already happening. Just need to celebrate it. So that's another piece. We have to find a way to, to tell things. So Gail and then Jonah. I think just getting students to look up, and not, I shouldn't just focus on students, is a big thing. When I first came on campus, I made this comment to you and Stephanie that after driving for about 15 minutes, it struck me that not one student looked before crossing the street. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not it's a problem. To, you know, for oncoming traffic and you're just this little human on two legs, 
what does it take to get us to look up, not just them, but us? Right. Remember those crystal gates in Central Park? I sure do. Yeah, I Froze my butt off looking at them. I was actually texting while walking, and I thought, you know, this is really messed up. If this doesn't get you to put down the damn cell phone, and right. up, something is wrong with you. And the experience has stayed with me ever since. Mm. When I feel myself tempted to do this while I'm walking, I just remember Christo. Well, actually, last night we were we were thinking about when there was a security walk, and um, and for the looking down thing, we decided we were going to start painting um, iridescent murals on the ground and some things that say "look up." And there's there's ways to interrupt again interrupters. Jonah. Yeah, I was thinking about interrupters as well, and the um, you know a lot of the times if we work <coughs> in the cultural sector, whether it's a contemporary art center, or a theater, or a museum, or a band, we use the word audience. And I was listening to such an inspiring talk, which it's, it's so right on. And, and I, I really think that Madison, you inspire artists. Yes. Thank you. It's one of the best things. But I was reflecting <coughs> and I wondered, what if the arts organizations dropped the word audience and audiences, which sounds in a way still always to me kind of rather uh, intense and us and them. And I just want to call attention to other uses of language, for example, um, if it's the football stadium, it's actually fans. Mm. So using fans. Or if it's digital media, oftentimes we use the word users. So you have 21,000 users. On or friends. Or if you're social media, it's followers. Right. So fans, okay. users, followers. Or if it's something like a, I mean, we just had elections in November, so participants or voters or trying to get to just entirely other uses of language and terminology. So instead of saying, we build audience and we engage audience. What? Well, what's already there? And mm -hmm. how do? Or if you're, you know, you're at a club and you're, you're not a user or a follower or anything. You're just at a club and you're kind of. Following. You're a club goer. So but there's of, action in that. An audience yeah, is exactly. passive. I like that. I and love how that. Take away the language of audience, which sounds like we have to bench press. <laughs> well, um, that's, Wait, this a, is a little bit related to something that I've been reading. You know, opinion piece. Um, don't ask for people to support the arts, ask them to participate. Yeah. Because yeah. The, the whole division between artist and audience or arts consumer <laughs> is something to, you know, that doesn't help us. Um, and that sort of elitism that's implied in that is something to get away from, so participate. I saw other hands. Well, that was exactly what I saw. I mean, you know, I think it's actually also about students if you ask them for their, your, your help, they'll do it. They'll be really excited. But ask them to go to a performance. And they're like, I'm too busy, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But I think that you know, clearly being a participant is, is a great answer. Do. Love that. If they don't build the show, they'll, they'll attend. If they yeah. build the show, they'll attend. Right. True. If they build it, they will come. Right. We just had the pronouns wrong. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Just my hope for you is that <clears throat> my hope for you is that you remain as open as you are. Because so many people come to Atlanta and there's kind of this negativity sometimes that's all about what's not possible. You know, and there was a curator at the high who came in, in photography, and he kind of said, fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he really, literally, I mean, I, that was a genius, of course, because I'm getting English, and that all helped. But he really, he really saw the possibilities. Right. right. And never, never listened to the negativity that sometimes comes with inferior, your art and complex that Atlanta has. And he was able to accomplish that. So my hope for you is that you remain open. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and just in case, I did this before I got here, but this says stay open. Oh, wow. Right? Uh, um, ironically enough. So I, I have a constant reminder. Um, but yeah. That, so if, if, I, if I find out you're not, I'll just... Just me. if you come by oh, and you see this is all scratched out. Hey. <laughs> then you see me like this in my office and it's not working or I'm not having a good day. But, but thank you. Um, it's really been an honor to, to, to blather on for a while this evening and to share some thoughts and ideas. And again, thank you, Julie, for, for, um, for making the space for us to talk and to stay warm and inspired. Thank you. Thanks.
Now you should see what my notes actually say. 